Welcome back, gang. It's Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com. Whether you're new, returning to the Elder Scrolls, I'm going to go through the ultimate beginner guide. Step A all the way to Z to give you the basic information, how to play this game, how to know what's going on, and how to be effective early and have a lot of fun. Are you ready? Let's get started. Okay, so we're at the screen here, and I'm going to create a new character. This is actually an alternate account that I have, 284 champion points, which I'll explain in a little bit. Character creator all the way through the tutorial is the simplest and easiest way to explain what to do in the game. First off, you're going to hit create a character. This screen is going to pop up, and it gives you a lot of important choices and a lot of information. The number one most important choice and what people kind of fuss with is the racial choices. So you have alliances, and then you have races. If unless you buy something specific in the game that allows you to use all alliances, all races, you're actually locked into picking races underneath this banner. The Daggerfall Covenant, Aldemary Dominion, Ebon Heart Pack. The game since one Tamriel kind of opened up the map. So this will not lock you into those specific zones after you get going and start playing the game. What it does is primarily lock you in for PvP. Those specific campaigns that have PvP, you'll have to fight under one of three banners. So unlike other games with uh, PvP, this not doesn't have two faction, it has three. But really think of it kind of as a PvP choice mainly and where kind of you start typically, but it will lock you into the races. So I typically play uh, Daggerfall Covenant, but you can pick whatever you want. When I very first started, I was all the Mary Dominion. I even switched to have an pack. So I played them all, liked them all. Now, what people usually want to know is about the racial choices. So Elder Scrolls Online has racial perks in the game that actually influence performance. I'll say this once. Do not stress about it. Even if you pick the wrong one, whatever wrong is, you can change it. There's high level players that play with suboptimal racial choices. Pick one that looks cool and is fun. Don't worry about the performance so much. I'm going to go through them with where the game currently is and kind of give you a rundown of what these racial choices look like. We're going to start with the Daggerfall Covenant and Bretons are up first. This is the really strong magic race. Bretons have this humanoid appearance, so they like if you like the humanoid look, this is a good one for you. Also, they're incredibly strong with resource sustain. One of the top tier healer ones that people typically take. And in PvP, if you struggle with resource sustain or you're starting out, and that's just casting spells frequently, this could be a strong race. Orc, this is a really brutal martial melee in your face fast. Has a really cool unique passive uh, for sprint speed. Think of these as kind of like the brutal um, PvP class, if you will. Specifically, stamina and weapons is what I usually play in my orcs. Red Guard um, is falling off meta, but they're really, really good for resource sustain, stamina specifically. So if you're going to use a bow or a two-hander or dual wheel primarily, you're starting out, you don't have any champion points, you're new to the game, this is an okay race to pick, but it's really falling out of favor because it's just better options for you. Moving over to all the Merry Dominion, and then we have High Elves. This is a blend of really good magic, resource sustain, and damage. It's typically your go-to caster for a couple classes. Like some people use it for magic sorks and Templars. Templar specifically, it has a unique passive when you're channeling to reduce damage. So very, very strong if you're going to play a magic-based Templar. Don't stress if you're going to play stamina. You like the high elf. You like being tall and have an elf. It still works just fine. Wood Elves, <laughs> the very opposite of High Elves, very small. It has a unique speed passive. Doesn't have much for damage, but it has a lot of resource sustain and a lot of speed, which is unique. A little bit different than the Orc, but it's kind of a fun race if you're going to play a bow and try to run around. A lot of people use this in Nightblades and PvP. Outside of that, though, it's not tapped to your damage. And I personally don't like the look of them because they're just very little small. But it's a decent race if you're going to play stamina, specifically with the bow. And then Khajiits. This is really, really high damage. It has a very unique passive currently for critical damage. Now, there's a cap in critical damage. Not going to go into the weeds with it. But think of the Khajiit as very well-rounded. Magic health, stamina bonuses, good recovery, and absolutely crazy high burst. Typically, this is what I play um, on and off stream, both um, as a damage dealer and a PvP character, just because of its insane burst potential. Moving on to the Ebon Heart pack, we have Argonians. This used to be one of the strongest races in the game um, for resource sustain. Now it really fell out of favor, so it kind of got overhauled and it's okay. It's very, very strong as a PvP healer, probably the strongest. It's incredibly tanky, durable, very survivable. It happens to be one of the lowest, if not the lowest, damage dealer races out there. 
but it looks absolutely cool. Just like the Khajiit with the tail, it's Argoni. It just, it's a really cool look. So if you're not like super serious about performance and you want something to be very durable and survivable, take an Argonian. Next up is Dark Elf. In the game, the way it currently works, not gonna go in the weeds and the details and the math, but Dark Elves um, are considered the best in slot race at max level end game. It gives you magic pool and it gives you stamina. It gives you weapon damage and it gives you max magicka. So the nice thing about this is you can flex in and change your build very, very easily. And that's something you wanna take, a, take away from this video is if you make a wrong choice, you can basically fix almost anything in this game. So don't stress if you don't take the right thing. But if you're looking to do super high damage at end game, then you want the sub most optimal one. Currently, this would be one. And then we have the Nord. All the Skyrim fanboys and fangirls out there will love these Nords. Um, they're like the meta tank race. They're incredibly durable. They can generate ultimate. They have very high resistance, frost resistance. But think of them as like really, really good for tanking. They pair very well with Dragon Knights, which we'll get to the classes in a minute, um, especially for PvP or PvE tank. It's a go-to race. Now you'll notice one more here, Imperial. So Imperial, I think you have to buy uh, something extra to be able to get this. But Imperial is an extraordinarily well-rounded race. So what it does is reduces cost of all of your abilities. This includes block, dodge, um, all of the core mechanics in the game. And when you're starting out, typically what you struggle with is resource sustain. Because in this game, there's no cooldowns. You can essentially cast an ability over and over and over. That could be a heal, which everyone has the ability to heal themselves. Everyone has the ability to do damage and so on. So when you're starting out, really the capacity to do really well is, is kind of tied to your resource sustain and being able to keep casting spells. Because this is not Skyrim where you're just doing light and heavy attacks. So don't feel like you have to take this race, but if you don't know what one to pick and you like the humanoid look and you want to play stamina, you might want to play magic, you don't know, this is one to pick. Okay, so you pick your race and you pick where you want to go. So I'm going to go do a Nord on the Ebonheart pack just because I'm a Skyrim fanboy. I'm going to spam a couple buttons here for um, my name. That looks lovely. Now you get to the class. Now, when you pick a class, you cannot change this. You have to start all over. So this is a very important decision. Keep in mind, Elder Scrolls Online, every class can tank, heal, and do damage. So as a damage dealer, you can heal yourself. That's what attracted me to the game originally in 2014. So don't stress if you pick something, it's not the optimal way to play at endgame. For 99% of the content, regardless of what class you pick, you can do just fine. It's when you're going for the absolute hardest things to do in the game, both PvE and PvP, the math of the classes and the races matter. So I'm gonna work left to right and just talk about them individually. Dragon Eye is my currently my favorite class to play. It's extraordinarily tanky. It has a lot of flame damage, huge, massive flames everywhere huge aoe lots of control and it's currently one of the best damage dealers and the best tanks in the game what's the downside it's terrible as a healer you can individually heal yourself but not very good in a group so if you like the tanky meathead aggressive playstyle, dragonite's great moving on to the sorcerer these are exceptional casters the uh, right now currently the magic sork is what i recommend for beginners you get very powerful abilities and spells right away in the game you can have great healing, great damage, play at range, and extraordinarily survivable regardless of what gear you use. Stamina Sork is um, kind of a very, very fast, aggressive playstyle, and has a very unique ability streak that makes it so much fun to play. Both in PvE and PvP, it's a very good class, and what I recommend for beginners is a magic-based sorcerer. Moving on to the Nightblade. This is sneaky, sneaky stealth. So if you like being a rogue, you like being an assassin, you like playing solo, this is a this is probably the best class for you. It's a high skill cap, though. It's not very forgiving when you very first start, so I'd recommend this class if you like the rogue or you like the assassin, but just realize you're gonna have to really play the game at a high level to get the most out of this class. Next up is a Templar. This used to be my favorite. No longer anymore. It kind of just a watered down class in comparison to what it used to be. I still recommend this for beginners though. You get an ability early on called Puncturing Sweeps. It's your main spammable ability, meaning you cast it over and over and over. It does damage and it heals you. So even when you're starting out the game, you don't know really know what to do. You can just throw on that ability and basically use it during your entire leveling process and do just fine. It does well as a healer, it does well as a range damage dealer now, and it used to be a really strong PvP melee character. It's very, very durable and has a lot of healing, but it doesn't have a lot of utility or anything to really to bring it um, exceptional like it used to. Next up, we have the Warden. So the Warden and the Necromancer are two that require a separate purchase, so keep that in mind. Think of the Warden as a gassed up Templar. It's just much better, has better group utility, 
very, very good healing, crazy high burst damage. It's very mobile. It plays well at range. It plays well in melee. It's one of the strongest all around classes. Everyone's going to want you in a group and you're incredibly durable. The only downside of the warden I see right now is its resource sustain is pretty terrible. But you can pick one of those races and pair it with it and not have a problem with it all and be very survival. A lot of damage and be very quick. And then last up is the Necromancer. So this is kind of like a Warden and a Dragonite mixed together. It's very tanky, has a lot of group utility, but it's extraordinarily hard to play. So pulling off a Necro, not very easy because it has a lot of abilities that you have to cast and maintain. It seems like all you're doing is constantly casting abilities and then doing damage a little bit. So keep that in mind. But at a high level, it's incredible as a damage dealer, incredible as a tank, has a lot of group utility. Another downside is resource sustain is kind of bad, and it's very slow. So in comparison to the Warden, I feel like I'm crawling sometimes on my Necro. But I play my Necro a lot, and I love it. Okay, so let's go pick a um, Nord Dragonite. I'm not worried about the facial appearances and all that stuff. Let's fire this up and hit Crate. So we're going to actually play the tutorial so I can show you some of the basic combat and get you used to the combat and give you some little tips on that. The game's tutorial is a bit lackluster, if I'm being honest, because this game is incredibly complex. There is so much nuance and so much things to know and learn as you get used to this, okay? So let's break down some of the core mechanics that you're going to have to use in a bit. All right, so to start the tutorial, and now we're going to get some weapon choices, okay? So when you make some weapon choices, since I'm going to play a tank primarily, I'm going to grab Sword and Shield. Let's grab it. Yay, we got Sword and Shield. Now, with Sword and Shield, as soon as you equip it, um, you can use it. So the core mechanics of the game are light attacking and blocking. So I'm playing on a uh, mouse and keyboard, but you have light attack and you have block. Light attack and heavy attack are two different things. There's actually medium weave. So light attack is really quick. It's on a one second cooldown. What that means is when you light attack, until you can do a leather light attack, you basically have one second. And if you do a fully charged heavy attack, it takes about two, two and a half seconds roughly. The advantage of the fully charged heavy attack is it gives you back resources for whatever you use. So as a new player, you want to try to get in this weave of using a light attack and only a fully charged heavy attack. Typically when you need to stun something when it's off balance, more on that later, or you need resources back. So you can get resources back, your stamina pool to cast more spells and movement, or you can do a fully charge heavy attack and combine it with potions. That's kind of how you can be very, very uh, efficient with your resource pool. So let's go and see what she has to offer. Okay, now we're gonna learn about the basics of combat. So it's showing us light attack here. It's doing the light attack, again, a one second animation, very, very simple, and it doesn't cost anything. The only thing it costs you is time. So there's no resource cost with the light attack. Now, when you block, you notice in the bottom right of my screen, that green bar, that's your stamina from traditional Elder Scrolls games. It costs that when you get hit. Also, you don't regenerate stamina when you're holding block. So be cognizant. If you're just sitting there holding block, you can be vulnerable to stun. I hit, this guy hit me when I was blocking. I set him off balance. That's why he's kind of wobbling around. So you can follow that up with a stun. The game really doesn't tell you that. So now we got a stun, block the attack, use some stamina, follow it up with a fully charged heavy attack. It's a way to control NPCs and actually players as well. And then when you get to the real game, you'll see little twirlies above their head and it'll say off balance specifically. That's how you know. Break free, I rebound to C. By default, I think it's two buttons. So I like to break free. If you're going to do PvP, this is a core mechanic. You can see it costs a lot of stamina and you'll get immunity for a while. All right, so with, with that with CC immunity, it's about seven seconds. That's more relevant in PvP than it is PvE because you're not going to get stunned a whole lot. So keep that in mind. Once you break free, you can't get stunned again for about seven seconds. Um, so what I did there is I bashed to interrupt, and then we're going to charge that fully charged heavy attacks to stun. You're not going to be doing that a whole lot in the open world, but you can see the sprinkles light up. That gives you the sign you need to bash the enemy, and that's kind of how the core mechanics work. Bash, fully charge, heavy attack, get some stamina back. Bash also costs stamina as well. Destroy it, yay. Oh boy, I have no abilities. This is taking forever. Yay, I got level two. Okay, before we go on any further, we're gonna go to what happens when you get to level. You're gonna get an attribute point, you're gonna get a skill point. We're gonna go to claim. 
You can see that I got some experience points with one-handed sword and shield, so I can level that up as well. And then we get to attribute points. If you've played other Elder Scrolls games, this is like a usually a huge decision. It's actually not that big of a deal in Elder Scrolls Online. So don't freak out if you make the wrong choice. You can always make another one. You have magic, health, obviously, and stamina. So it tells you what you can use these for. Stamina, break free, sneak, roll dodge, etc. Magic, basically for casting spells. And if you want to get it back, you have to fully heavy attack with a magic based weapon like a frost staff, a lightning staff or a flame staff. Um, and then health obviously is the attribute for, well, health. What most people do at endgame if they're playing PvE typically is just stack or basically optimize your build for one specific stat. If you're going to play a caster, typically you do magic. If you're going to play a melee damage dealer or use a bow, you typically do stamina. The reason why is the more of this attribute you have, the harder you hit and actually the better you heal. So if you mix them up, you're not going to really heal or do uh, that much damage like optimally. So I would recommend as a beginner is to take a couple into your main stat. Again, caster magic, stamina, melee, or indoor a tank. And then if you're dying frequently or you don't have much food, feel free to stack into health. You can always respect this at the end of the game. At, not even at the end of the game, the beginning of the game. You can respect this pretty much any time for a little bit of gold. You'll see you have a bunch of other stats here. I'm not going to go into the weeds with this, but the game can be quite complicated on what to optimize. But in general, you have spell damage, spell crit, spell pen, weapon damage, crit, penetration. The game is a um, hybridized now. So what that means is, let's say you're a magic based character. You have 64 attributes, which is the max, into magic. But you're using stamina sk uh, spells and skills. Those skills and spells will still do really well because it focuses on what's the highest. You might have spell damage at the really high and you're playing a stamina build. Meaning if you make a mistake or playing and using different skills and you're not aware of what the best loadouts are, it's okay because the game will figure it out for you. What I'm trying to tell you is just stack one. Don't stress about mid maxing and everything else when you're leveling out. You'll figure this out uh, as you go. We said we're gonna play a tank. I'll probably play stamina base. So I'm just gonna put one attribute here and commit these points here. And then I have um, one skill point to um, basically unlock. Skill points are very, very important. When you're very first starting on, you have two bars. Each um, has five slots and a ultimate. What I typically do is have one, my front bar is kind of my uh, uh, offensive damage dealing bar. And my back bar, when you can bar swap, is usually like a defensive or resources or buffs or survivability. So this bar up front is very, very simple. I just use it for damage. And I go back to my back bar, reapply some stuff and you know, go rinse and repeat. On the front, you can have ultimate. I usually do a damage ultimate. What I want you to take away from the skill points is this. Your character gets extremely powerful with passives because you can only slot so many abilities. So when you're very first starting off, you can take all the passives from your class. You can take all the passives from the weapon skill line. Nothing's stopping you. And in fact, each of them do a lot for you as you rank up. So what I recommend you doing is not looking over the passes and not reading them, not understanding them. For instance, let's go to the Dragonite, one of the most powerful um, things in the game, Battle Roar. When you cast an ultimate ability, you restore magic, health, and stamina for each ultimate point spent. So basically, if you have 500 ultimate, which is the max, and you use it, you heal the full and you have full resources. This is what makes Dragonite's very, very unique. And if you didn't take this passive, your character would lack the number one thing that your character has. And you don't have to slot a skill for it. So your goal and your progression when you're very first starting out or coming back to the game is working on collecting a lot of skill points, unlocking these um, passives, getting the right um, weapons and getting the right weapon passives and the armor passives, which we'll get to a little bit later. This is how your character gets really powerful quickly. It's not like fancy gear and stuff. People can have fancy gear, but they don't have passes. They're gonna hit like a new door, heal terribly. Um, so we need get one ability. As a Dragonite, your, your abilities are kind of terrible to start actually, if I'm being honest. But when they, when you get going, they're very, very powerful. So I'm just gonna take Whip here. It's a staple ability. I'm gonna put it in my four slot, which is what I always use um, for um, my uh, main spam bolt. So let's go grab here and just finish this up. All right, it's teaching you a sneak mechanic. Let's assume you played other Elder Scrolls Online games. You have to basically kind of be out of line of sight and then you sneak. It also uses stamina as well. There are some gear sets and different things that you can basically almost run while you're sneaking. 
and goes super, super fast as well. So if you like playing sneaky, sneaky, there's there's tons and tons of ways to optimize this. There's actually Thieves Guild as well. And then you can sprint. But you can see all of these action-based stuff are kind of consuming stamina. Something you have to be cognizant of because stamina is what you use to break free. So if you don't have enough stamina to break free, typically you're dead when you get into an encounter. It wants me to zoom out my camera so I have max field of view set so I can zoom out really, really far. Now we're gonna make our move through the area. So this will be an interesting encounter. We got our first guy here, fully charged heavy attack, and then I'm gonna use my main spam whip. 9,000 damage, look at that. Boom, and light attack whip, light attack whip. Now I gotta increase my uh, one-handed sword and shield. The thing about one-handed sword and shield or increasing weapon lines or um, is basically you just have to have it equipped and it'll start increasing like typical test games. Same thing with your, your skill lines on your bar. It'll level up. So you want to make sure that you have the right weapon you're using on your front bar. You can actually cheese this by putting a skill on your bar and not even using it. And that weapon skill line will level up a little bit more advanced. And regarding skill points, there's a lot of different ways to get them. You can get them from sky shards. You can get them from quest completion, specifically the main story quest. You get them from completing dungeons and there's a tons of dungeons as well. And you can get them from completing public dungeons. So there is a bunch of skill points. I think there's over 400 now. So there's a lot to get a hold of, but don't feel like you have to get a hold of them all right away. There is a lot and you'll have access to them. You'll get them pretty quickly. Oh, well, here's the sky chair, but it looks like we got a little mini boss. Okay, so we really have no way to heal ourselves. So really we're just gonna kind of use our ability and do some light attacks and the NPC is gonna heal us. Now you see how it looks purple? There's actually an in-game setting in gameplay that makes that a lot easier to um, see visually because I'm not using any add-ons. Here's the block with the sprinkles. It'll proc off balance. You can see that little thing there, that little circle over the head. And you have this here. So it's just a lot easier to see. Now let's finish the guy. And loots, yay, rawhide straps. Here's a sky shard and you collect it, collect three of them, and you get a skill point. Um, there's a gazillion of them laying around the uh, overworld and the delves and stuff like that. So you're gonna have the ability to collect a lot of these. And plus there's add-ons you're playing on PC that help you find them, or there's different websites and so forth that will have maps of where these are. So part of your priority when you're leveling is to basically just kind of take your time and go and pick up the sky shards because that's what's gonna make your character powerful, giving you a bunch of skill points. All right, so we're done with the tutorial and the tutorial might look different depending on what chapter and what version of the game you have. So with me, I think I have the High Isles chapter so I can pretty much go to all the other content and you get kind of a, a choice. So my character is the Ebon Harp Pax. You can go to the starter areas and that's usually the best place to start. Bleak Rock Isles is where I'm gonna check and just go there. Travel to Bleak Rock Isles. Okay, now you started. You got done with the tutorial. What do you do and why? So Elder Scrolls Online goes up to level 50 and then beyond level 50 is champion points. I'll show you that in a bit. But what you need to do is basically level up to 50, is your number one priority, and then you're not done leveling up then. CP 160 is kind of where gear is capped and then you can start collecting relevant gear. Seems complicated, but just another form of progression. But level 50 primarily is your goal. Once you reach level 50, you're still gonna have to level up skill lines. You're still gonna have to get skills and abilities and morph them and level them up. So there's still a lot to do. But with a small amount of investment of time, anywhere from 50 to 60 hours, even as a new player, unless you're really questing, you can get pretty optimized in this game and start doing end game content. At least I did. So we're gonna go grab this quest and kind of just see where it takes us. Okay, now you're at Bleak Rock Isles, the starter zone for the Ebon Heart Pack. If you wheel your mouse back a bit, you can see just how big Tamriel is, the Elder Scrolls Online. It's massive. These little symbols here are dungeons and they have DLCs. So it's just telling you if they're blacked out that you can do them, but you haven't done them yet. Once you do them, you can get a skill point, which is why it's useful to kind of do them all. And then you can see that you have to own the DLCs or use ESO+. Plus. So ESO Plus gives you a couple different options, but don't feel like you need to subscribe. It makes crafting and uh, obtaining crafting bags and, and bag space very, very useful. Also, you get access to all the DLC dungeons and the DLC dungeons themselves have gear inside them that you have to obtain from there. So it just gives you more option to collect more and better gear. When you're starting out, none of that really matters. 
you're just going to play the game for fun and kind of go around questing and not freaking out about having the best in slot gear. So if you don't want to um, do this part of the story and you want to get some of the main starter towns, you can just take this boat swain right here in the dark. This boat swain will take you to the main starter town, Stone Falls for Ebonheart Pack. All the Merry Dominion, while I'm showing that, just in case you pick them, is uh, Oradon. And Canarthi's Root is the starter area for AD. Daggerfall Covenant has Glenumbra, and then has Scross Mackay, and actually two islands, Betnick as well. So those are kind of the main starter hubs, and you can travel in the Boatswain and get there. And then the game starts opening up. I'm going to come down here and talk to the Ebonheart Pack Boatswain. I want to go to Davin's Watch. Or Balfoyan. I'm gonna pick, uh... Uh... I'm gonna go to Davin's Watch in Stone Falls. One of my favorite zones in the game. And this is where the game starts opening up. And you can kind of decide what to do and why. You get here a hooded figure. My benefactor wants to talk to you. This will kind of set in motion the main story quest. Okay, now let's look at our character for a bit. So our character has two free skill points, okay? So what you want to do with your character, very, very important when you very first start out, you get three skills. So you want to do one from each skill line. That way, throughout the entirety of your playthrough, as long as they're on your bar, you're going to level these skill lines kind of uniformly. Because remember, the passives are what make you powerful. So we got Lava Whip, we're going to take Spiked Armor, which is just an armor buff. And then we're going to take Stone Fist, which is kind of just a range damage ability. Dragonite's terrible when you very first start out, you have very little healing. So it's kind of a, a struggle starting right away. But other classes like the Sork, not so much, or the Templar. Now there's actually a trick. You can get a free ability called Soul Trap. Soul Trap is incredibly strong. It's a damage over time and costs you magic. So even on stand bill, you can use it if you have excessive magic. But when you morph it, it morphs into Consuming Trap very early on in the game. When you cast this on an enemy and it dies with this on top of it, what happens? You get a flood of resources back in health. So it's very, very, very strong, and you have the ability to put on your bar straight away. And so we'll unlock another skill, and we'll unlock ultimate skill line, which is really ultimate, at rank 12. So our skill line is set up. So now what I typically do is I go to the main town, and this is going to be important for later on. There's various guilds from traditional Elder Scrolls Online that you can unlock, and some of the progress and progression in these are not retroactive. I'm talking Fighter's Guild, Mage's Guild, and Undaunted. So Undaunted's typically in the tavern here. Let's go down here and unlock that. What that does, it's going to give you a skill line that's going to grant some passive benefits. It's extraordinarily good at endgame. When you very first start off, it's not like super concerning. But if you unlock it when you're progressing through dungeons, public, delves, doing that sort of thing, you can advance the skill line. Um, so you might as well unlock it straight away. So you come down to whatever tavern is in your main... Um, land here and grab the Undaunted. We are the Undaunted. So just kind of do a little sing dance thing and then go give you this uh, quest to do the main story, or excuse me, to do the very first dungeon, Fungal Grotto 1. And see, you unlock the skill line. So Undaunted is unlocked and then you can kind of progress it. If you ever are confused on how to progress a skill line, you simply put your mouse or cursor over it or whatever is on consoles and it will tell you exactly how to do it. So complete group uh, dungeons, arenas, and trials quest as well as Undaunted pledges. Undaunted Pledges are kind of a daily thing that unlocks at level 45 and beyond. They're very important to do. Consider that like a daily priority once you get to level 45 and beyond. So now we got a couple skill lines unlocked. Let's just keep working on them. So we're going to crank back up here and go talk to the Fighters Guild. The Fighters Guild have some of the best skills endgame. Also, some of these skill lines, the Fighters Guild and the Mages Guild, are worth leveling because the ultimates are very, very useful and can be used on pretty much any type of class or role. Flawless Dawnbreaker and Mages Guild Shooting Star. They're the staples in damage dealing. So we're going to grab here the Hall of Steward. I'm just going to skip this, sorry. And Fighters Guild Unlocked. So again, Fighters Guild Unlocked under the guilds. And it tells you, destroy Dark Anchors and kill Daedra. So Fighters Guild pretty much levels very passively, um, just by playing the game and doing dolmens and delves and so forth. Mage's Guild, not so much. Mage's Guild, you're going to have to go get lore books. Now, there's add-ons that do this on PC. They're blue little shiny thing. I think there's actually one in the Mage's Guild I'll show you. 
So why another reason I do unlock these in the specific fashion before I set out on my adventure is so that I don't have to rinse and repeat and waste a bunch of time going back and getting the sky shards one time and then go getting the lore books another time. You want to do it all at one go if you can and you have this available to you. So we're going to go here. I think this is the one. Yeah, I'm ready to join the guild. You guys are not. You guys will just let anyone join, huh? And then we'll go back around here. And I think there's a Mage's Guild book scroll here. The Elder Scroll. Nope. Okay. And also you're getting skill points for just unlocking these as well. So here we go. Origins of the Mage Guild. So you get this guy. Boom. Little pop up. And it tells you basically you got that uh that Mage's Guild book. Boom, lore book discovered, and you can see it kind of progresses. So then you have to do a lot of Mage's Guild um, books in order to get this. And you can just see if I turn the add-on map pins on just how many they are. But Abnor Tharn, very, very, uh, uh, I see my he is the main character at the end game, but I'm not going to get to him yet. Don't want to spoil it. No spoilers. So now we've done, done some good stuff here. We got our Fighter's Guild unlocked. We got Mage's Guild unlocked. We got Undaunted. And we have one um, weapon. So remember I said there's two weapons that you can choose from, right, in the game. So let's go to our inventory. We're going to take food. So Crown Store, you kind of get these Crown Store um, different things from daily logins. So let me show you here. Go to daily rewards if you just log in every day and just like go collect this you'll get experience scrolls you get tons of food you'll get tons of potions and poisons and stuff to use so it's extremely vital early on to get access to this and just log in every day even as a free-to-play player it doesn't matter but if you can log in this will be used at any level and really increase your max stats more max stats mean you're harder to kill and you're better at doing damage and healing a potions this will give you a flood of resources back this is what I usually use when I'm at, oh crap, I'm about to die. Poisons are something that you apply to your weapons that do a little bit more damage. They can get very complicated later on at the end of the game, but something great if you don't have enchanting early on. So make sure to log in and get those uh, daily, especially when you're first starting out. Now, let's talk about horses. So horses, um, usually you can unlock them by default. I think after you've leveled up to like level 10 or 15, you get one by default. So uh, whether you bought the Imperial Edition like I did for this guy or you got this little horse here, you can get that out and ride around. Now, at the very beginning of the game, it's incredibly slow. It might be slow or just the same as your, um, your, your actual walking or sprinting, but it doesn't consume your stamina. So you can see in the bottom right there, there's two stamina bars, one smaller one, and that's consuming my horse's stamina. So you can increase all of this stuff and you can do it once a day, I think every 20 hours roughly by coming to the stable here. You're gonna wanna focus on this right away because it makes the game go a lot faster. So you go fuse stable and then you can buy it. It costs 250 gold each to increase your stamina, or excuse me, speed, stamina, and carry capacity. Typically what I do is speed first, max it out to 60, and then I go carrying capacity because that's a huge burden in the game, and then stamina. Stamina is really just good if you're gonna zoom through the overland, you don't wanna get attacked or you're doing PVP. So that's kind of why I rank it that way. So we got our horse, we're doing good. Now, if you have to level up to 10, 15, that's how you have to do it. Now, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna grab some gold and show you something to do. Okay, from here on, typically what I do is I grab just a bunch of quests in the main area. You can see on the top of my bar or right here, typical Elder Scrolls quests, just grab a bunch of them. You have a maximum of 25 that you can do at a time and you're gonna have three or four for different guilds and so forth. But just grab a bunch that are uh, in this little area and then you go complete them. The reason you want to complete them is you want to get some gold. I think it's about 250 gold or something, depending on what you do um, per quest turn in. Plus, you get a bunch of experience. It's very, very useful for what we're going to do next. So I'm going to assume that you can get that done. And then once you get that done, you're going to come back here. OK, and then you're going to have these vendors. They're in every single big area. Davin's Watch Market District. They'll have a market district with all these same vendors. And what I do here is I grab specific weapons that I want to use and unlock. Companions are a system that were added in, in Blackwood and you can get them at any level. Not going to go into that in detail. We have them on the website. Check the link in the description below. Um, but at end game, I'm probably going to use an ice staff with this guy. So I'm just going to buy an ice staff. You see it's 16 gold. It's almost nothing. So let's grab the ice staff and then I'm going to equip the ice staff. I apparently bought two of them. Okay, so I got the ice staff equipped. Um, I'm going to go um, basically get that ice tap. I'm just going to go kill one critter with it. 
And the reason why is it'll unlock the skill line for me. So let's just go out here and kill one critter. And destruction staff is unlocked. So now hypothetically, I could put that ability if I had a skill point on my bar. And then regardless of what weapon I was using, I could level the skill line simultaneously. That's what I always recommend to new players is you have three abilities from your class skill line and you swap them out and kind of morph them and kind of get your build sorted. And then you have uh, this free ability here or you have a sword and shield ability and a frost staff ability. That will give you five abilities on your bar, which I'll show you once I get another skill point or two. So you can level simultaneously two um, weapon abilities and three skill lines from your class. Now, the one that you don't have equipped, let's say I have a frost staff equipped and I have sword and shield, I just put the ability on my bar. You're not actually not gonna be able to use that ability, but the game doesn't care. You're still gonna level it. So it'll be a dead slot, um, but you'll level both of them at the same time. Because once you get bar swap at level 15, then you're gonna have a lot more skills at your disposal. And then you can actually have a really nice build within just a couple hours of starting the game. So I highly recommend that if it's too confusing or you don't want to fuss with it. Just take it off your bar and just go very simple. Okay, so we got that unlocked. Um, so we got our two um, weapon skill lines unlocked. Now what we're going to do is get the armor unlocked. This is, again, very, very important for later on in the game. So we're going to go to the armor. What I'm going to do is just buy three pieces of armor. You can see this is a lot more expensive here. The armor is. I'm just going to grab one, two, three. And then I'm going to clip three of them. Also, you have the strong box that has various weapons and so forth, so you can save a little bit of gold and time doing this. So I'm gonna go one, two, three. Boom, unlocks a skill line for me. So I've talked about skill points. You can see how important these become. Heavy armor has a bunch of them. Um, so to max out a character, you have weapon skill lines, you have armor skill lines, you have guild skill lines, you have class skill lines. All of them have unique passives. Think of heavy armor as simply tanky, you're gonna have more um, more may HP, more resistance. Um, and that's kind of what it is. You get a little bit resources back with constitution, but more resistance is more HP. Very, very simple. We're gonna get a leather worker, leather working here. Um, we're gonna grab, let's just grab, let's see, legs, head. I grab the right one and then arms. Did I grab the right one, please? I did not grab the right one. Go back to helms, my first time doing this. Uh, there we go. And then as soon as you equip three, you unlock the skill line. But you don't actually have to use those three. Okay. So now we're going to go and grab a couple of lights. So there should be a clothier nearby here. Here's a tailor. Not a clothier. Tailor. I don't know what game I was playing. Um, but we got this guy. So we're going to grab a shoulder here. Um, we're going to grab... Let's grab... Let's grab the gloves. And I forget we're missing one part of boots. And that should give us three. So lights, we're gonna go shoulder, gloves, and boots. And bang! Now you have all three weapons, or excuse me, all three um, armors unlocked. Why is that important? Because you level up armor by having equipped and earning experience. All of this is doing is basically setting up your gameplay experience to be much, much easier at endgame because as you progress, if you didn't do this, you wouldn't be able to buy the passives. So what do the passives do? The main two are light armor and medium armor. So for damage dealing, typically people level up in this game as a damage dealer, because it's just abysmal leveling up as a, as a healer. And you can swap very frequently and very easily. Um, so you have light armor. What it does is, is, is this passive here gives you more magic recovery and just reduces uh, the cost of magic abilities, makes it easier for you to cast. You have some damage ones once you get a little bit longer in the skill line, which will make sense a little bit later, but that's why you wear light armor if you're a caster. You need to you you give you some damage, but also makes the casting of the spells easier. Medium armor, same sort of thing. So it has increased stamina recovery, reduced stamina cost. If you're using weapons as your primary damage source and stamina as your primary damage source, these are like your number one passives to unlock straight away because it makes casting the abilities much, much easier. And then heavy armor, you can throw that in the mix. If you're going to tank or you're going to do PvP at endgame or even PvP healing, um, this is something you're going to unlock. So let's say I have this character here and I plan on using this character as an endgame tank and an endgame PvP character. Then I have my armor one medium, two medium, three, 
a um, couple lights and then a couple heavy. So this would be a good setup. So that way, if I kept this type of loadout, I would level up all three skill lines simultaneously. Weapon skill lines. And then when I got to end game, I could really specifically focus on one type of build and you can always change your build. Speaking of changing your build, let's show you where to do that. So to change your build, you need to go to various shrines. Um, the main starter hubs have these shrines of Mara, which is basically you can marry a character if you have uh, something in the game or you they got the version of the game. So if you back out here, you got different areas that have like their main capital city. So Deshaun is for the Ebonheart pack and Warhold. And you come here and you go to this uh, rededication shrine. So Mara's to get married, Kynes and Stoons. That's to respec your skills, your morphs, or your entire skills, or your attributes. So if you screw something up, don't sweat. It just costs a little bit of gold. That's for Ebonheart Pack. The old Mary Dominion is Grotwood with the big old tree ski. And then Daggerfall Covenant is Stormhaven. So you go down here, and this shrine right here, Stormhaven. So you'll have to go a little bit, a little bit of travel, but you can travel to a player if you're in a guild, or you can just walk on your uh walk or ride your very very slow mount to get there so that's how respects work so don't sweat it if you make a mistake or you don't have the right optimal thing okay so we got our character kind of set up and um i do a little bit of stuff um behind the scenes that will help you out quite a bit i go to settings and i kind of go through all these different settings now it's going to be different if you're a console player i get that but some of them will be the same so let me go through and kind of show you what I do. Under gameplay, remember the purple little circle if you didn't skip ahead? This right here is how you do that. So you can actually have a wheel and set it however you want, and then you can test it this way. And same with the green. I would turn the um, color as max, so it's very, very easy to see. Double tap to dodge will get you into trouble. I almost always turn this off, almost always recommend someone to turn this off. Because if you're on PC, you're gonna fat finger it and run out of stamina. If you run out of stamina, you can't sprint, you can't block, and you can't break free, meaning you're very likely to be dead, especially in PvP. So I turned that off. Um, protect attacking the incense, I always cast stuff, so I turned this off as well. And then auto wait, you can turn that on for simplicity. That's kind of nice. And then tutorials, I do turn off. If it's your first time, I would uh, keep that on. Um, under camera, I turn screen shake off. That's kind of annoying. I don't know why it does that. And I put field of view at max. So I want my reticle kind of right over my character. You see how it's not? Kind of like, almost like a shooter, really. So I kind of fuss with my camera until it's like right there. Uh, let's see, minus 20. And I, I zoom all the way out and it's kind of right over the top of my character. That's where I usually like my camera, just right above it. And the reason why is the further out you can zoom, the more information you have. If you want to play in first person, that's fine. But if you're worried about performance and you're struggling with the game, zoom that puppy out so you can get more information. Um, another really important tip here is um, inner nameplates. Name plates are very, very important. So you don't need to say you put your name on, but I would turn the name plates on. And this one here, um, show when you're injured. So I'll just kind of show you the health bar will pop up. The reason that's very important is you want information on when you should heal yourself. So if you're down to 60, 70, 50% health, you need to stop what you're doing and heal yourself. You will get access to healing abilities on every single class. And I have builds on my website, deltiasgaming.com, that has every single one, every single class, every single play style, a beginner build that will help you. So let's get an engagement here with these guys. See how they have a red bar and I have a, a green little bar that popped up. As soon as I stop taking damage, it goes away. But it's useful because I don't have to change my eyes to the bottom of my health bar. Thank you, friend, for helping me kill that. So that's what that does, and it's extraordinarily helpful. I got some light armor leveled up. Let's go. Look at that. Um, under social, there's some like auto dueling stuff. Combat is pretty important. I personally always do, um, always show my ability bars on. There's some add ons that give you bar timers. This is really important when you get to end game, but I like always show because I'm not playing this like a role playing game. So I turn all of this on. And then that way I have all this information. I can see the numbers and percentage of my health. I can see my abilities at all times. So I'm not guessing what to click. Um, I would recommend if you're going to play multiple characters to set like a typical whatever your heal button is and the exact same button on your bar. That way you don't miss click frequently. So my characters, I usually have my burst heal, something to heal me at my five key. Reason why, if I get in trouble, I know five key is going to be my heal. And you can kind of see it down here. Now, a clue with your, like, if you're stunned is your bar is going to light. It's not going to light up anymore. Or if you're out of resources, you're not going to be able to cast it anymore. So let me get down here. Oh, I got good resources to stay on this guy. 
Do you see the bar will start turning? It'll start going gray here in a second. Boom, I'm out of magic. You can see that magic flash. I'm out, I'm just out of resources. So remember what I told you earlier is, if you're out of resources, just fully charge heavy attack. Boom, you see that magic come back? Boom, it's coming back. And it's doing damage. And it's absolutely free. And that's why typically in end game PvP anyways, I have um, an, a way to get stamina back with either sword, dual wield, sword and shield on my front bar. And then I have a way to get magic back on my back bar. Flame staff, typically a frost staff because it's pretty good, pretty tanky. And then I don't have problems with resource sustain. And then once you get this leveled up, soul trap, you morph into consuming trap and you're really, really good on resources because nothing's stopping you from casting over and over and over. And that's what keeps you alive. Let me go hop on my main character, my main account and kind of show you what to do and what an end game character looks like. Okay, so on my main character here, my Khajiit um, Dragonite. And let me kind of hop around here in my house and show you a little bit about the systems and kind of what to do now that you have a decent sense of your character and progressing your character because Elder Scrolls Online has a gazillion things to do. First up, I'm going to open my menu up and you can see this top bar. There is just a ton of stuff going on. So the crown store, typically that's where it's like buy stuff, you know, buy cosmetics. They actually have something called Seals of Endeavors. So endeavors are actually a way to earn some of these items. You have to do it a very, very long time, but under the group and activity, you have daily and weekly endeavors. So if you don't want to spend any money in the cash shop for cool cosmetics, you can do that because otherwise it's loot crates and you know how those go. So this is the crown store. A lot of the starter quests are in the crown store, um, like in chapter starter quest or special um, zone quest or whatever is going on. Usually they put it in the crown store so you have to come in here and get your appetite wet and buy all the stuff. I would not necessarily buy all the stuff, okay? So there's only a couple things that I think are really, really good uh, to buy. Things that save you a ton of time, like these assistants. They're extraordinarily expensive. You got 5,000 for um, the armory assistant. That allows you to basically change your builds on the fly. You can summon it in a bunch of different places. You got merchants, allow you to sell stuff um, in random different places. You got rag picker that will allow you to deconstruct stuff that will in a lot of different places in the banker. So the banker is my favorite because I can basically put stuff in my bank and then go deal with it later. And then the rag picker is the second, but 5,000 crowns each. You gotta be careful because this is kind of a slippery slope. Another thing about the uh, crown store is you're gonna have all these utility items like potions and experience scrolls and stuff like that. The experience scrolls are very, very easy to get a hold of. Just daily logins, you'll get them. So don't feel like you have to buy them straight away, especially with like uh, these potions and stuff. Same sort of thing. You're gonna be getting these on the daily login if you're playing consistently. So don't feel like you gotta be pressured to buying any of this stuff. If you wanna buy something, that's really good. Uh, you can buy mounts straight up, but you can also buy like riding speed. So that'll save you some time early on, but I'd really highly recommend not really buying much unless you're gonna commit to the game and get the assistant. So that's kind of the crown store and it kind of talks about ESO plus and then daily rewards and so forth. Um, I'm not gonna show you the loot crate stuff. Here's your inventory screen. So you can see this is kind of like a maxed out level character um, for PVP and I have all this gold gear. So gold gear is like the max quality and you can upgrade your gear by crafting. Now, crafting is essential in this game because some gear that's bound to you, only you can level it up. Only you can make it maximum effectiveness. So you'll have to level that and at least take some of the perks to do it. So if we go to this guy here, this guy is not my crafter, but you can see I have 50 points into blacksmithing. How do you get blacksmithing to 50? You basically find items laying around in public dungeons, questing, uh, delves, PVP, it does, doesn't matter. And then you just deconstruct them. You start learning the traits. There's a bunch of traits. And then you start leveling it up. And then you get to, to here and you can take some of these things, which in increases the chance of improving items with tempers. And you can get research some items, you can extract materials, and you can take the passives. Again, you can see how important passives are. Just make sure that you start working on crafting and you realize even if you're not into that, you're going to have to do some of it. Very simply, if you don't want to get really involved in a crafting, you basically just need to level it up by deconstructing excessive items that you're not going to sell, use, or vendor. So that way you can upgrade materials yourself. Okay, so we got this guy here. Um, so I got tons and tons of gear sets on, and this is called the Mythic. So it looks kind of complicated, and it, it kind of is until you very first start off. But this is your inventory screen. So working left to right, you have weapons, you have armor, jewelry, potions, like consumables. These consumables include food, they include um, XP scrolls, they include motifs that you consume. 
and then you can have like better fashion. People love those, by the way. Um, the biggest thing about the inventory and kind of how to manage it is you can see here, I have 199 space. You can actually pump that up significantly, but your inventory fills up very, very quickly, especially if you're a free to play player um, and you're doing um, crafting, you're gonna fill up your inventory straight away. So it's something that you want to use your gold on. You'll have a bag merchant in those main stores, those main places I showed you earlier. So let's go back in here in Stone Falls and you can see every place will have a pack merchant, very bottom there. That person will allow you to upgrade your bank space and your individual, or excuse me, it will allow you to upgrade your individual character space and the bank space when you go to it at your main uh, guild place, like, where is it at? Right here, this banker it'll allow you to upgrade your bank space. So your bank space and your personal space is where a lot of your gold starts out until you get maxed out. It's, it gets more and more expensive the longer you do it. So that's kind of what I would focus on to make managing this not a nightmare. There's different ways to search and add-ons. Like I have a bunch of add-ons why it looks different than the normal UI. It helps you basically sort through all these gear sets. So you can see just how much stuff that this character has. And I use pretty much most of it. So that's inventory um character screen here so what you need to know about this again it's a pvp character you have titles um outfits here if you want to like change your fashion on the fly you have your attributes which we talked about earlier and you have all of your stats okay and then you have your riding skills so it'll tell you oh you can feed your horse right now it's not, not on cooldown here's where they are you have munda stones which like traditional elder scrolls games you can go grab to get a special power and then you have food and different buffs that are up. So the buffs will tell you here. You hit this advanced stats and it tells you every little mathematical nerdy thing about your character and your class. So that's what that looks like, the inventory, or excuse me, the uh, character screen. You don't get a whole lot of information unless you're trying to mid-max your character or you just wanna check if you have food up or if you wanna check if you have a Munda stone and you have, um, you know, have feed your horse. So Munda stones, if you're not familiar from traditional Elder Scrolls games, look like this the mage there's a bunch of different ones if you're new and starting out one that i highly recommend pve pvp unless you're tanking is basically the thief the thief gives you increased weapon and spell critical and it's a lot why that's relevant is it increases your healing and your damage done you're gonna need both you're gonna need to do damage and you're gonna need to heal yourself now weapon and spell damage are also good they're a bit more consistent but the crits the base part of the crit is 50 percent so you can add on more and more crit damage. Not going to get too complicated, but it's a very, very good Munda stone. Now, when you're traveling out and you don't have all the way shrines, you don't everything explored. As soon as you see a Munda stone area, just take one. One, even if it's health or something else is better than nothing. You'll find these different locations. I'm not going to go over them all of where to get those Munda stones. Okay, now we're going to go to skills. And so this is kind of a, the skill setup for like an end game character, what it looks like. So you can see I have all these leveled up, um, taken. Some of these I don't have actually the skills because I'm not using them. I have them taken, but you can see just how many weapon skill lines there are. They don't even have them all. I think I have restoration staff on here. And then armor I have all maxed out, right? World. Um, there's some other things here called Sigic Order. <clears throat> this is really, really incredible for PvP. It's a nightmare to level up. I haven't shown you that yet, but just realize if you have specific content to can access this, you're going to want to do this straight away with Mage's Guild because they're all over the zone. So you can kill basically about three birds with one stone. Alliance War. This is PvP. Okay. So PvP has a couple of different facets in this game. Number one, I hit the L key is what it's bound to me. And it brings up the screen. And there's instance-based queues that you can go fight 24-7, 365. All you do is hit that and hit enter campaign. The campaigns are a bit complicated, but really what it comes down to is capturing the Elder Scroll and scoring points. You score points by holding resources, towers, outposts, Elder Scrolls, and you can see it's a massive area, 365, 24-7 brawl. Doesn't perform that well right now. Server performance has always plagued this game and it's not perfect either, but this is kind of like the bread and butter aspect of PvP. Once you hit level 10, you'll have another aspect of PvP called Battlegrounds. And in your group menu, you can queue for it. If you do this once a day and get first or second, you're going to get a massive boost of experience points and you're going to get really good weapons and materials you can use straight away. So as a new player, as soon as you hit level 10, you're going to want to start doing these every day. Even if you suck or you get destroyed, 
doesn't matter. You're just trying to play objectives and get first or second. It's if you, there's three teams, obviously. So you, you got to actually play the game, but you want to get that done. Also at level 10, you're going to get Dungeon Finder and it has similar rewards. The gear sets from here are really, really good. Plus massive uh, influx of experience points. So if you do anything, you just log in into your Dungeon Finder and your Battleground Finder and just kind of go quest around, you're going to level up very, very quickly. So don't stress about leveling this game. It goes very, very, very fast. And that's what those two things do. Now, another helpful thing um, to get you kind of familiar with the game. And when I very first started, I loved the game. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. All I did was basically white out the map. I would just go from zone to zone to zone to zone. This isn't my main PVE character, so I basically have nothing done. But the zone guide in here will allow you to kind of have some idea of where to go and what to do. So like Balfour in the starter area, it tells you that the different story quests that are available, the different way shrines, um, points of interest on your map. They have these Pathfinder ones and a lot of different achievements along with Sky Shards here. So if you don't know what to do, but you're in a zone, you're looking for activities and are confused, you just come into the group menu and this zone guide is very, very helpful. Me, yeah, I've done most of them. I don't really do the story quests anymore, but that's what it is. Um, the Endeavors talked about that already. Group, if you invite someone to a group, you have Normal and you have Veteran. So there's basically kind of three modes in the game. Normal, usually pretty easy. Veteran, not that hard, but for new people, it will be hard. And then you have Veteran Hard Mode. So you have Hard Mode and uh, PvE, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, lastly, touching on the PvP. There is another thing that you can do, and that's called Imperial City. The thing about Imperial City is it's inside of Cyrodiil, this little area here, and you have to queue into an instance separately. It also has flags, but it has a unique currency called Telvar. So it's PvE and PvP mix. Think of this as the end game play loop for PvPers that want to make gold. It's very, very good to make gold. Cyrodiil is kind of fun, dominating the huge maps. Battlegrounds are like really quick, instant space, snappy, combat oriented. This is basically stealing people's if you kill another player you get 50 percent of their telebar you can cash those telebar in and basically get really good maps for the game so kind of three aspects to pvp that most people do now pve it's a bit more complicated so there is a lot of content to do in pv like a lot so if we come to this menu and we go dungeon finder and we go specific dungeons look how many dungeons these are so there is this many normal versions and there are this many veterans now, dungeons, again, they are normal or veteran. You can queue them up, meaning matchmaking, or you can go in with a group. It's four players. You can also do, when you do veteran, you can make a hard mode. There's tons and tons and tons of achievements in this game. So if you love achievements, you come here and you can see just how many achievements there are for veteran dungeons. There's death, slayer, speed, survivor, and they give you some cool little um, titles. And sometimes they give you like, little badges and uh, little all sorts of stuff, little outfits, a lot of cosmetics. Mainly the cosmetics are tied up into trials though, if I'm being honest. Speaking of trials, let me show you that. Trials are 12 player group content. Now trials, there is quite a bit. If we go into our collection system. So what I did was this collection, which I'll show you in a little bit and trials, you have AA, Asylum, Cloud Rest, Dread Cellar, Hell Rock, Hines, the Maw, Rock Grove, Sanctum, Sunspire, the Halls of Fabrication. You can see just how much gear there is to collect in these. And they're 12 players. So you can't downsize them, you can't upscale. So it has to be 12 players. Now, you can just go in there with less, but it'll be pretty hard for the average player. Normal versions of the trials are very easy to do. Um, there's only really a difference in veteran mode with the gear sets. So you can see uh, Aegis here. And then if you have the perfected version by doing and collecting the gear, which randomly drops from the bosses in treasure chest, then you get this, the perfected version. But really it only adds one little line item to your gear set. So it's not like you have to have this. So don't be afraid to do trials. Uh, there is no group finder for trials, no matchmaking, unfortunately. So what a lot of people do is they just come to Craglorn here in Belkarth, the main uh, city in Craglorn. It is base game. And they just come to this little way shrine here, the Belkarth way shrine and said, hey, one DPS looking to do XYZ trial. I wouldn't start doing trials until you're at least CP uh, 160, maybe 300 or so. I wouldn't wait till you're 2000 CP champion points that is, and you're like very experienced. 
you, you can get in and do them pretty early on. But if you don't have a guild, this is where to go. Um, going back to um, the interface and guild specifically, um, guilds are right here. This is my guild on PCNA, and you can actually look for guilds. There's a guild finder. So guild finder, you can browse guilds, trading group, social, so forth. I would highly recommend just trying to join a guild. You can see how many active members there are. I would join one because once you're in a guild, you can actually travel to the players. So if you don't have way shrines, you don't have locations, not only to socialize and get groups and figure out how the game works, but you can travel to players. So like, let's say I go to my guild here and I just go here. I can just go travel the player. You can also visit their primary residence. And so guilds have a lot of utility. In this game, you can have five guilds, which is kind of odd. There is no main guild per se. So you can, a lot of people have like a PVP guild, a PVE trial guild, a casual guild, and they have like a couple different um, guilds to sell wares. And that's how you basically play the marketplace is through your guilds. And then you can sell stuff there. And there's a lot to explain in this game. You know what I mean? But that's the too long didn't read on guilds. Find it, ask to join one, socialize, and, and there, there's an advantage for joining the guild. Um, so we went over the skills. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you the collections UI real quick. It looks extraordinarily complex until you use it. There's collectibles here. So it kind of tells you what you've collected if you bought anything. Appearance, you can just have tons and tons and tons of cosmetics. I'm not gonna go through them all, but you can see personalities, polymorphs, furnishings, housing's a thing. I'm in house, my house right now. More on that later. And you got companions here. These are little battle buddies that can aid you in combat. And you have your assistants, mementos, tools, mounts. There's a gazillion mounts, emotes, and then special. So there's a lot in this. And then story. This will tell you and help you out on uh, various different story in dungeons and DLCs. So if you, let's say, have a DLC or you're interested in playing one and starting the story, you can actually come here and hit accept quest. And then bang, it pops it up get a quest giver and then it'll tell you where to go and what to do so they've made it pretty easy to actually follow along the story you don't feel like you have to do the story in a specific order i'd highly recommend everyone do the main story quest from the main story quest it kind of goes in order here you can see imperial Sunium, thieves dark brotherhood you can just follow along i would do the main story quest and then i would do imperial city they're fantastic and if you don't want to do any quests from there on that's fine but the game revolves around solo pve questing typically and then you have housing, everyone's favorite. So houses are collected, you can buy them um, with crowns, really. There are a couple little ones you can buy with gold too. Like this one, the Flaming Nyx Hound, or Flaming Nyx Deluxe is what I buy. Houses are useful because you can store stuff in here. So this is like one of mine that I use. So I have Munda Stones in here, I have crafting stations, I have bank storage, I have my little vendors. Um, they're not necessarily when you very first start out, but if you are starting out in the game, each main town has a little house that you can get. It's wided out since I actually own it. And I think it's like very, very cheap gold. So like 10, 30,000 gold once you get it and you want to get a house. I like the Deshaun one because this is where the main um, hubs of all the big guild vendors are right in this main town area. So Deshaun is a really, really good one. Uh, and you can see right here in the tavern, you come out, boom, here's the main town. You got all of the things that you could need merchant wise and guild stores. So that's what I like in there. Uh, and there's like, I mean, look, look, there's a gazillion of them. Housing can get very expensive, not only in gold, but actually in crowns if you want to spend tons and tons of money on the game. Um, I don't do a whole lot of housing because the game is, housing is more like Legos. Like you can really go crazy with all the stuff that you can do and, and set in here. And like to show you here, you can put all your trophies wherever you want. And it, this editor is very complex. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but just to let you know, if you like Legos, you're going to love housing Elder Scrolls Online. If you're like me and like Fallout 4, where your housing basically had impact and combat and you had to defend things, you're not going to like the housing in here. But I'm in the very rare minority that doesn't like the housing. Most people do. Okay, speaking of collections, look how many item sets you can collect fashion-wise. There is literally a gazillion, bazillion fashion items in here. Comes head all the way, all of your body parts, into um, weapon styles, which are tons and tons and tons and tons of different styles. You can see how many I don't have to collect it. How you collect them is it kind of tells you right here in the outfit style. You can get a lot of these from vendors and guild stores. So a lot of people spend a lot of gold just basically getting the style that they want. Um, this game has a transmog system, so if I go outfit or no outfit, that's how my character looks undyed. And if I go to outfit, that's how it looks. So your gear that you actually equip 
is not actually how your character looks, which is nice. Um, so transmog or whatever you want to call it. You have to go to an outfit station. They're in every single major town. It's like all of the crafting stations are as well. So that's how that works. Set items. You can see all the items that you collected, where to go to get them. Yeah, I kind of use this as reference. So once I'm familiar with some items, I can go, go in here and see which I have collected. I have a lot of the stuff in the game because I play a lot. But the reason this is useful is another complicated system. But when you collect gear, it comes in random traits. OK, so let's say this overwhelming surge comes from Tempest Island. So I go to Tempest Island and boss encounters. I have a chance of randomly getting this um, these item sets. With the collection system, the more you get, um, it starts to prioritize what you don't have. So the bosses in here, the very first few just give you body pieces and the very last gives you weapons and jewelry. So what ends up happening is you can basically collect every single thing in a dungeon in about eight hours. If you farm it on normal, doing it over and over and over and over again, you'll collect the body pieces very quickly, jewelry a little bit slower, and then weapons very last. And that's what you're going to go for the last boss or the chest have some random chance to do this. And you can see this transmute cost. Transmuting, very complicated. But what it allows you to do is basically reconstruct items that you deleted or got rid of as long as you're in collection system and make those items the right trait that you want. So another reason to level up crafting is you have to unlock those traits. And this at end game, along with crafting, that's how you get very, very powerful gear. Now it's a lot to go over now. Check the website for end game builds, but a lot of people use this system. And so how you get transmutes a variety of ways, but most people get it through doing these dungeon finders, uh, normal dungeons. They'll give you 10 at the end of them. Battlegrounds will give you like between one and five. And then Cyrodiil will actually give you some too. If you're in the top, if you're in tier one is what it's called, about 25,000 alliance points. At the end of a 30 day campaign, you get 50. So a lot of people will just do random dungeons on a bunch of different characters. So that way you can get a bunch of transmutes, use that to convert that currency into reconstructing and remaking better gear at endgame. No, it's a little advanced, but that's what it is if you're going to look through the collection system and wonder. Um, Tales of Tribute is a card game that was released at the High Isles chapter and you have to own the High Isles chapter. I don't participate in this. I, did, I never found it fun. I love Pokemon and Magic the Gathering, but this is kind of a low energy card game. So I have guides on my website about it, but it's not something I really participate in. Um, the journal has, again, all the achievements, um, leaderboards, the different scores and all sorts of stuff if you were into that. So there are some uh, leaderboard based activities to do at, at Endgame. All right, so now you got a good sense of what to do, kind of the interface, how it works, just the basic mechanics of the game. <laughs> Where do you go and what you what do you do? And that's basically about impossible to answer. PvE, I haven't really gone over, but you have dungeons, you have uh, trials, which we talked about. We have delves, we have world bosses and in particular zones all over throughout the zone. The basic premise of Elder Scrolls Online is just explore the zones. Explore the zones, wide it out, use the zone guide, and kind of explore and, and do things. I would use a combination of exploring, doing the zones, collecting sky shards, lore books, having fun, questing, and also doing a dungeon finder here and there, a battleground uh, here and there, and then I would use the zone guide. Try to meet players that are like-minded, and then see if we want to group up or form a guild or join a guild. And then start asking people what they're doing, they want to join up, you want to form, fight world bosses, and so on. Most of the end game players are always going to migrate to the last zone in the game. And the reason why is there's new things to collect and do in those zones. So the very beginning zone, people will actually be in them, but it's not going to be very dense population because most of the people are, are working on the end game material. A lot of the popular zones are Deshaun because it's a main hub and Craglorn is very popular. This is also base game. Um, but the further out you go, the less populated it becomes. And so again, you have that zone guide to kind of walk you through which specific quest to do and why, if you're trying to follow in a specific order. And then you can use your map marker to kind of see what these activities are and if matchmaking is available. Let's go over some advanced combat tips. So I'm using a PvP uh, character here, um, and I'm going to basically take on something that's pretty challenging, 10 million HP. Now, I'm not going to do the whole thing. I've done it before on different classes, but... Just to make you aware, I'm going to walk you through kind of my thought process on the combat. It might be complex for a beginner to look at and understand, but I want to make sure I go over how to actually play the game. Um, as a beginner, what you could look like as a high level player. So that's 10 million HP. It's not meant to be done solo. Okay, so let's hope I don't whiff it. So first thing I'm going to do 
Um, I'm going to buff up. So I'm going to increase my armor resistance. I'm going to get my buffs up, my weapon damage, and uh, everyone has access to those. So once I get on this guy, you can see I have an add-on that tells me to block. And then part of the damage phase is just loading up on damage. Now, where my eyes look on a very uh, tough fight like this, I look particularly at my resources. So I can see I'm pretty low magic and I have good stamina. So I know I can dodge a lot. I know I can basically block a lot. I can bash like this mechanic here. And I can block here. And I'm looking good. I'm also maintaining a lot of heals. So I actually have three heals in this character. Because I want to be survivable. When you're very first starting out, survivability is the number one thing. It's not damage. Don't worry about that. You'll do a lot more later on. I'm about dead. I got stamina. I used the potion there. And I went back to full resources. You see? So I'm not doing a whole lot of damage. But I have the ability to heal myself. So my front bar is damage. And once I start doing damage, as soon as I start taking some, I go right back. So let's see here. And if someone shows up, I'm going to heal myself. I block that big, huge telegraph there. See if he can hit me. Holding block. Using a frost staff so I get block mitigation. I'm just about dead. Boom! Pop my ultimate and battle roar. I'm going to bash this guy. And this is kind of the weave. Hold block. So I'm just going back and forth on my front bar when I'm not in pressure. And you can see that health bar pop up in the middle of the screen as soon as I start taking damage. Now I'm in trouble. Gonna heal myself. Keep my buffs up. Go on my back, back bar. Get resolving vigor. Fully charge. Get some stamina back. Holding block here. And this is kind of the weave. I'm gonna bash and holding block. Now, as a new player, I highly would recommend playing at range because you're not gonna have to have this quick reaction time like this and know these mechanics and I miss one there. I'm out of resources. Remember what I told you. Fully charge heavy attack and block. Now, the add-on basically carries you and tells you where um, things are coming from. But you pay attention to your boss. See that little sprinkle? That's just a bash. I got CC'd here. See that sprinkle? That's the uppercut. So you just block that to mitigate the damage. Completely out of resources. I'm playing a Dragonite, so I can just bang. Boom, hit an ult. I'm full back up. But if I play this game this way, as long as I have resource sustain, I can basically fight this thing indefinitely. If I make a mistake or two, you know, I might die. But if this takes me a half an hour, as long as my character is built really properly for resource sustain, I understand the mechanics. I got a heal here, got a heal there, doing a little bit of damage, just about dead. Boom, 26,000 crit heal. <laughs> so I can heal the full pretty easy. Again, it's a PvP character, so it's very, very tanky, very, very survivable. And I'd always lean towards survivability as a beginner. So what's going to keep you survivable is having two different weapon types that you can get back magic and stamina, two different types of healing. So you're not dependent on a healer. That's very, very important in end game PVE as well. So now we're getting some friends to show up. I'm going to bash here. I'm low on resources. Boom, hit an ultimate. CC break because I was crowd controlled. And so you have to kind of put everything together with this. Now we have to get out of here. There's crap on the ground. Holding block, tanking a 10 million HP thing. And we're just getting after it. Whole block. You can also dodge as well. So dodging um, will take a lot of your stamina versus not so much. So next time it attacks me, I'll do a dodge. And you'll have a very small window where you can actually dodge and miss the attack. You can see how much stamina went back. The dodging mechanic is interesting because the more you dodge in a short window, the more it costs. That prevents you from dodging and having infinite evades like this, right? As you can see, it started getting more and more costly block and this is actually not a tank but you can be very very tanky in the game and this is the benefit of Elder Scrolls Online why I love the game I love the combat is every character can basically carry themselves and if you get really good at combat you can basically carry a group in this game so this is kind of what it looks like to have a sweat lord build at the, the very end game if you really want to be a try hard and do everything in the game this took me a gazillion hours to get to this level I am not the best player in, ever or anything like that I just play a lot and understand a bit of the game's combat. So when you're, you're starting out, don't sweat it if this comes, this is very, very unnatural. If you come from Skyrim and other Elder Scrolls games, the combat is vastly different. I have something called light attack weaving, so you can see my character will use a, a ability and then a light attack. It's a bit complicated, I have another video on that, but what that means is, all I'm doing is uh, syncing up my one second global cooldown of my abilities with the light attack. They're on two separate cooldowns. And cooldown means just a one second animation that um, prevents me from just casting the ability infinitely simultaneously. So your brain kind of has to wire yourself for what's the most advantageous action you can take for a one second global cooldown. 
So for me, I'm running out of resources, a little bit on the magic. So I'm gonna go back to my back bar. I'm looking at my ultimate. So my ultimate's up. I got a defensive one. I don't know what's gonna happen. There's a lot of crap on the ground, boom. So I'm going from using a tri potion, the crown store ones you get in the crown store, to using the ultimate to kind of basically have really good survivability. And then when I'm not taking pressure, I'm not getting heavy attack like this, then I just put some dots up and do start doing some damage. And then it's rinse and repeat. Getting slammed, about to die, boom, heal myself. My magic's a bit low. Usually I like to keep my magic uh, above uh, one quarter. So that way I get one or two casts, boom, see, 27k <laughs> crit heal right there. And that's why I use the Khajiit. It's just very, very, very bursty. So getting them down. And again, it's gonna take you a long time to kind of understand how to use these classes. Every class can essentially do what I'm doing here. So it's not very class specific anymore. Um, some classes are a little bit better than this than others. Some classes are more gear dependent than others. Dragonite is not very gear dependent. Um, the Sork is not very gear dependent and crazy good for beginners. In fact, it has something called Crit Surge, where every time you get a critical strike, it heals you. So if you just build for crit with the Sork, you're doing really good. Now, I'm just going to like run out of stamina on purpose here. And then I'll fully charge uh, on my front bar. And you can see that stamina come back. I break free, consume stamina. So you do not want to drop behind uh, below 5,000 uh, stamina. If you do, you get CC'd once, you're dead. That guy heavy attacks me. I don't block it or dodge it. I'm dead. Block. Going back. Also, you can use a one bar build and uh, not stress about bar swapping all the time. The reason two bars are more effective and you want to bar swap more frequently is you just have a lot more utility. You'll have access to more abilities and more healing. There's actually a mythic called Oaken Soul, which is a bit hard to explain, but that it basically does it all for you in one. So if you have a one bar build, don't sweat it. You can basically still pull it off. If you can't bar swap timely, you don't know when to do it. But you're going to need to heal you're gonna need some damage over time, and you're gonna need a way to resource sustain. Those are the three pillars to um, having your build. I lean towards more resource sustain and survivability than constantly just running out of gas, because I just don't like dying in the game. Speaking of dying in the game, I'm not gonna do it here, because it's a video, I gotta show you. But there's really almost zero repercussion for dying in the game. Like, all you have to do is repair your gear, and it's very cheap. So if you die, PvE, PvP um, outside of Imperial City, there's almost no repercussion. So don't be afraid to screw up. Don't be afraid to try challenging things because you'll get a lot better at the game if you actually try challenging things you're not supposed to do normally, like solo a dungeon, a vet dungeon, or any of that stuff. Like this stuff is kind of, it's just kind of for fun. You're not supposed to do it by yourself, but, and that's why it takes forever. Holding block. We're just got him to 10% now. So he's in execute range, which means uh, some abilities in execute um, get stronger the closer they are. I'm low on resources, so I'm gonna play pretty defensive. I don't have to do this all over again. Fully charge heavy attack, bash there with the sprinkles up. I'm gonna use a potion. So now I'm very survivable for a little bit. We're at two seconds. Example is uh, whirling blades here from dual wield. It starts hitting harder the lower the HP it goes. Some classes have uh, specifically their own, but Dragonite has to use an outside one. Boom! And then we got it done. And you can see all the loot that we get. Yay, I got my loot. It's ready to go. All right, once you hit level 50, you're going to have another form of progression called champion points. I have an add-on here, Dynamic CP, that kind of shows the champion point system in a very nice and easy to understand way. So kind of Skyrim players will recognize these as constellations and so forth. It looks obnoxious when you look at this. You don't know what's going on, how to do it, whatever. Well, basically champion points um, are earned just like levels and experience. The more you get up to 3,600. That number sounds really awesome, but you actually don't get more powerful beyond about 1,500 champion points. And you're starting to be relatively the same power around 800 to 1,000. The reason why is there's only four slottables that you can use per constellation for a total of 12. Now you can see there's actually a lot of slottable choices. So the way these glow indicate, and you put your bar over it, it'll say add new champion port bar to activate. So if you have 50 points in this guy, it doesn't do anything for you unless you slot it. So it's actually not that complicated once you start playing around with it. Most people take the exact same champion points on every single constellation, your PVE, PVP, it's pretty similar. So it looks really complicated. The, the yellow glowing ones, these are passives that do not require you to slot them. And there's actually not very many of them. So what this means is green is typically like the fun out of combat type stuff. 
A lot of people like Steed's Blessing because it helps movement speed. You have some stuff here down here to save you a little bit of gold on uh, consumables and some more mount speed and some sneaking stuff. This green one is kind of like the fun non-combat one. The blue one is kind of the complicated one for um, DPS. Most players come up here and take these DPS ones along with a combination of these right here. Um, this out here is kind of the tank one on the bottom. And then the left one is kind of the healer one. Now you're gonna see some purple and that is a sub constellation, meaning you have to go down inside of it. And then you have more things you can take. The number one thing I'd recommend for a new player is this. Don't worry about damage slottables and being super confused. What you wanna do is take either Tireless Discipline for max stamina or um, Eldritch Insight for max magic, depending on what you're playing. And you wanna come down here to Staving Death right away. You wanna take 10 points, which will unlock the, the thing to get to preparation. Take 20 in here for 10% damage reduction. That will make your life so much easier survivability wise when you're first starting out. And it's a passive, you don't have to slot it. Um, from there, you can start working towards really good ones like fighting finesse, increasing your critical damage, or out here, these don't require any points to start them. And you can basically get a benefit with literally one, 10, 50 points. You can get increase your max magic, which increases your healing and damage done. So when you're very first starting out, take these outside ones that don't require a bunch of points to move along the constellation. And the red tree here, same sort of thing. You have three that are not um, jointed on the constellation. And this is kind of resource sustained survivability and there's some speed ones. You also have a bunch of sub constellations here. I have a whole separate guide on this. So don't stress, use my builds for like um, different CP loadouts. It's actually not that complicated and you're not gonna be that far behind. Cause I mean, I've gotten like 1200 champion points on my EU account very, very quickly. just not even really playing. Um, so it seems complicated, like, oh my God, 3,600. But when you start playing with it, no, it's very simple. You take mainly the same ones. You kind of start slowly getting them. You take these ones up top here until you're a little bit more powerful. Then you make your way down the line to get the passive one and the juicy ones for PVE or PVP. Well, gang, that's the video. Hope you got something out of this. I am Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com. So come um, there, check out all the Elder Scrolls Online stuff we have. I also stream the Elder Scrolls Online currently, twitch.tv slash DeltiasGaming, where my mom claims I'm the best streamer alive. And I hope you got something out of this. Make sure to smash that thumbs up and subscribe if you want more content on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you watching.